Well, hey guys. In today's video, I'm gonna be covering the removal of hydroquinone from the over-the-counter market here in the United States. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Andrea. I'm a board-certified dermatologist. I would love it if you would subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the thumbs up. It really helps my videos out a lot. All right, some of you may have picked up on the fact that we are no longer gonna have hydroquinone available to us over the counter here in the States. Um, this has actually been something in the works since last year, and you know, you may have started to hear more and more about it. In order to understand why hydroquinone was taken off the market, you kind of have to understand a little bit about the FDA over-the-counter uh, medication regulation. In 1972, an over-the-counter drug review process was created by the FDA to ensure safety and efficacy of uh, medications sold to consumers over-the-counter. Basically what they did was to create a, a monograph for each category of uh, drug. You can think of a monograph as like a recipe book covering acceptable ingredients, doses, routes of administration, forms, and labeling. And basically drugs marketed in accordance with a monograph did not have to undergo FDA approval as a new drug application. So as part of this process, drugs were classified into uh, three categories. Category one is generally recognized as safe and effective and not misbranded. Category two is not generally recognized as safe and effective. And category three is sort of like neither, we don't know. <laughs> Prior to March of 2020, in order to add, remove, or modify an over-the-counter monograph required going through this complicated three-phase public process that was very arduous, could take up to 10 years, if not more, to ever change. And this had some serious actual safety implications. Basically, it prevented the advancement and introduction of new medications that could benefit patient safety in the over-the-counter realm. And it also prevented uh, rapid removal of things that maybe were shown with new data to be ineffective or even potentially harmful. For example, um, an antimicrobial that's sold over the counter, triclosan, uh, was found to have potential harmful outcomes, but they're really, because of, the, because of the old system, became very difficult to jump through all the bureaucratic hoops to actually remove it from the market. But on March 27th of 2020, the president signed into law something called the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, aka the CARES Act. Now this law included provisions which the FDA views as monograph reform uh, that allows for modernizing the over-the-counter medication approval process, updating, and removal. In theory, this is a good thing because it expedites uh, approval of things that could be available over the counter as medications, and it helps to remove things that we learn are you know, potentially harmful or ineffective. As part of this law, a final monograph was put into place for over-the-counter medications. Now, medications are category one, which is grays or generally recognized as safe and effective, and category three, aka, mm, <laughs> we don't know. Uh, provided certain provisions, they were allowed to remain on the market. However, anything that was category two uh, had to be removed within 180 days. Who fell under that umbrella? 2% hydroquinone. Hydroquinone is one of the best ingredients for treating diseases of hyperpigmentation, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and melasma, very evidence-based. Um, dermatologists honestly are kind of split as far as their thoughts on whether or not it should be over the counter. And I can see reasons on both ends of the argument uh, for keeping it over the counter and or removing it over the counter. To be clear, 2% topical hydroquinone is very safe and effective, especially when used for a short term period. Um, however, older literature using antiquated uh, methodologies uh, raised some concerns and it seems as though people fail to look into the newer studies with better methodologies that have kind of refuted a lot of the concerns. Most common problem 
is irritant contact dermatitis. Now for somebody trying to treat hyperpigmentation with an over-the-counter hydroquinone cream, if they develop irritant contact dermatitis, it actually will worsen the hyperpigmentation and they may not realize that that is what is going on. And another potential adverse effect, of course, is allergic contact dermatitis, but that can happen with anything. Rarely, there is a complication with chronic hydroquinone use called pseudoochronosis. It is a disfiguring uh, skin uh, rash, if you will, that is bumpy and discolored. Um, however, truthfully, that just doesn't really happen with the over-the-counter 2% hydroquinone creams that we have here in the States. It has mostly been reported using hydroquinone creams that are bought in other countries that have very high levels of hydroquinone and other ingredients in them that increase the risk of pseudoochronosis. And they, you know, again, are in a very high concentration. So truthfully, in reality, things like Ambifade cream and other over-the-counter hydroquinone creams that I've talked about on, on here before, like the different dark spot corrector, I don't have it here, uh, those are, you know, not likely at all to cause pseudoochronosis. Now, people always love to fear monger around, uh, around hydroquinone, and it's been banned in many countries for a long time. And because, you know, it kind of falls into this category as not generally recognized as safe and effective. It's effective, but there are still lingering safety concerns. Uh, one concern that people always bring up is this issue around does using hydroquinone, applying it to the skin, does it cause cancer? No, it doesn't. If you are a rat injected with a ton of it, you may develop a renal cancer, but human data actually shows there's no risk of any type of cancer with topical hydroquinone. As a matter of fact, you can feed a human 500 milligrams of hydroquinone a day for five months and there's no cancer. So there's no data showing cancer in humans, only in those earlier rat studies using a very high amount. Uh, remember, we're not, we're not lab rats, so they're, you know, and, and it's the root of administration. Hydroquinone, as a side note, is naturally present in the foods that we consume. And, um, you know, there's always been this comment that, well, it's gonna be absorbed into the body when you're putting it on the skin and that, you know, likely has harmful effects. And when this is brought up, they'll often cite a study that was done a long time ago where they showed 57% dermal absorption after hydroquinone was placed on the skin for 24 hours. But what you have to pay attention to is the fact that in that study, the hydroquinone was in a 71% ethanol vehicle. Ethanol is a well-known penetration enhancer that increases the penetration and absorption of hydroquinone. There is not a single over-the-counter hydroquinone cream that is in a 71% ethanol vehicle. Uh, but the FDA focuses on that, which is, you know, kind of odd, you know, suggests, you know, are they operating in like some sort of tunnel vision? Because on the flip side of that, an FDA approved hydroquinone treatment, Triluma, which has 4% hydroquinone, that's twice the amount of what was available in over the counter stuff, has been shown in dermal absorption studies to have a very negligible absorption and it is very rapidly excreted in, in the urine. The absorption studies suggest that it is comparable, the prescription stuff, the dermal absorption is comparable to what you are exposed to by eating things that naturally have hydroquinone in them, like fruits, uh, strawberries have hydroquinone in them. So this argument that, oh, it's gonna be dermally absorbed, it really just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, data shows that in cream forms, it's not really absorbed, negligible, and it's comparable to what you would get from ingesting food. A lot of people also point out concerns about fertility. That is based on old data in uh, you know, lab animals using antiquated, uh, antiquated uh, protocols. Modern studies with standardized uh, teratogenicity and reproductive bioassays don't show any of them. Uh, several years ago, I did a video debunking the safety concerns of hydroquinone. So I'm gonna link that video down below, but it is a very safe topical. But 
there is always the concern for irritant contact dermatitis, which can actually end up worsening the dyschromia or hyperpigmentation which you're trying to treat. So I'm making this video because you know you may have noticed that it was pulled from from the shelves. If you're using hydroquinone that you bought, I want hopefully this video reassures you that you know it's not going to cause cancer. It's not a dangerous ingredient. We've been using it in dermatology for over 50 years with no concerns other than the contact dermatitis and at high percentages there is a risk of pseudoprenosis and of course contact dermatitis, which you can develop to you know you can develop contact dermatitis to any number of things. Uh, but by and large, two percent over the counter hydroquinone cream is more than safe. Um, I have always been of the mindset, however, that hydroquinone, in my opinion, is best utilized under the supervision of a board certified dermatologist. Why? Well, because of monitoring of things like irritant contact dermatitis and helping to decide, you know, the appropriate window of time for treating with the hydroquinone, weaning off and transitioning to something else. This is not something, you know, this is something that's actually very difficult and sophisticated for a consumer to navigate. Most consumers are going to see a product labeled an over-the-counter skin lightening cream that has 2% hydroquinone. They're gonna pick it up and there's not really a lot of education on how to use it, the risks, the side effects, how long to use it. And how long to use it kind of, you know, it varies from person to person what is necessary. So my opinion has always been that it's actually best executed under the supervision of a board certified dermatologist for these reasons. However, I do recognize that over-the-counter hydroquinone has really benefited many patients in managing issues of hyperpigmentation themselves. Um, it really provides a degree of autonomy. And, you know, so for example, and many people with deeper skin tones, if they get a bug bite or they get a pimple or a scratch or something, it often heals with a dark mark. And we know that that can have actual psychological morbidity. Um, that is, you know, it's more than just a cosmetic outcome. It can have, you know, it can be disfiguring. And so having something easily available that is safe and effective, aka 2% hydroquinone, has been very helpful for, for patients of color for a long time um, in managing dyschromia, a disease of hyperpigmentation. So the people this impacts the most are people of color because they're the ones who primarily, you know, you need and use over-the-counter skin lightening creams to treat, to treat diseases of hyperpigmentation. And while I think it's better to use it under the supervision of a dermatologist, you can't ignore the fact that it's safe, it's effective, and people have been you know, managing issues of hyperpigmentation with it for a while and benefiting from it. And the concern now that it's no longer gonna be available is that once people have something that they know how to use, they know is effective, and it's no longer available, it's difficult to get in to see a dermatologist. That access piece is not always there. So I fear that the alternative people are gonna take is to go online and to get um, skin bleaching creams. The reason this is worrisome is because we know that there are you know, skin lightening creams from around the world that are have very high percentages of hydroquinone, which is not always disclosed, which can be even more irritating and problematic. They often will add super potent topical steroids, which the consumer may not realize are in there or know are harmful to use long-term and can be disfiguring. And a lot of times they are adulterated with mercury compounds. There are cases of people going online, buying, buying skin lightening creams, thinking that it's a hydroquinone cream uh, from kind of like a black market. You know, one of these online pharmacy, kind of sketchy pharmacy sites and uh, the, pro the product that they get, it's got mercury, mercury in it, or cases of mercury poisoning, very high levels of hydroquinone. It's actually a, prob a serious problem. Whereas if we just continue to have the 2% hydroquinone cream, available over the counter here, it's much safer. Uh, irritant contact dermatitis is a much safer side effect for people to run into than, than mercury poisoning. So I wanted to make this video to kind of update you guys. Um, some of you have asked me about it. 
Uh, I do have a video on alternatives to hydroquinone, so definitely check that out. Um, and I, you know, I wanted to make this video to point out the fact that I've always believed that it's better to follow with a board certified dermatologist. That's my opinion, but I do recognize not everybody has that opportunity and that a lot of people safely have managed issues of hyperpigmentation with over-the-counter hydroquinone for years. It's now no longer available. Um, I want you guys to understand though that I do, I would strongly discourage you from trying to get it online from, you know, a, a pharmacy, one of those online pharmacies, because we do see a lot of cases of people getting these products that actually have high levels of not only hydroquinone, but super potent topical steroids that can lead to stretch marks, they can lead to permanent discoloration of the skin, atrophy of the skin, acne-like breakouts, and many of them also have mercury in them and have been reported to cause mercury poisoning. Uh, so be aware of that um, and stick to alternatives that I've suggested in some of my videos, things like topical soy, niacinamide, licorice root, kojic acid. I'll link the video down below um, for you guys. Stick to those things. Uh, if you have hydroquinone though that you've recently purchased, uh, you know, you don't need to throw it out and fear that it is dangerous. <laughs> Hopefully this clarified that. The other thing that was removed doesn't relate to skin, but maybe you take it is uh, Zantac is, uh, I believe was removed as well. Um, Renitidine is the generic, you know, the, the drug name and then Zantac the brand name. That too was removed uh, due to concerns that if it's stored long-term at you know, a certain temperature, uh, it can degrade into a potentially carcinogenic compound. Uh, so they removed it because of that. Uh, but hydroquinone, I wanna emphasize, is not carcinogenic. It's not, doesn't cause fertility problems. In a 2% cream vehicle, as has always been sold over the counter, it is not going to absorb into your bloodstream to toxic levels. And again, there are no fertility problems. Uh, it's very safe, no cancer risk, and it's naturally present in the foods that you eat, so you do not have to fear it. The main risk is irritant contact dermatitis uh, and potentially pseudoocrinosis, which again, very, very rare in the 2% cream strength, more common in high percentages in vehicles that have penetration enhancers or other compounds that also are associated with, with pseudoquinosis. Um, I hope this video was helpful to you guys. Uh, comment below on if you are a hydroquinone user. Uh, if this is, you know, this is gonna impact you. Did you, did you know about it? Um, I'd love to hear, hear you guys' thoughts in the comments. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.